Good morning. My name is Amar Jyot Singh, and I'm talking to one of my uh, esteemed uh, immigration lawyers whom I personally follow. Uh, um, today is, uh, what is it, July 30th, and, uh, you know, people are suffering due to restrictions of coronavirus and other impact uh, on immigration processing due to various reasons, travel restrictions, ban, you know, uh, uh, economic recession, and who better to talk about these issues and other issues than uh, the immigration lawyer from Vancouver. His name is Richard Curland. Uh, Richard Curland is uh, somebody who, Richard does not even know that I follow his tweets and follow his lecture on EMEDA and other places uh, very minutely. Last year, I posted on my YouTube channel something that I came to know from Richard. I did not know this about the use of artificial intelligence in evaluating TRV applications in Delhi, I think in China, in Turkey, and other, other areas. And that alerted uh, me to this widespread problem of uh, boilerplate refusals, which I'm sure Richard will uh, elaborate uh, you know, in, uh, in detail. Richard, welcome to my show, and I, I appreciate that you're joining me. And I'm a great fan of yours, by the way. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you. Uh, how's, uh, how's everything uh, going on in your, in your personal practice in immigration? How do you see things evolving? Well, uh, thank you for having me. I see things evolving uh, in a good way. Uh, because of COVID, the uh, administrative system, uh, the immigration authorities, the judicial authorities have leaped 20 years in technology because of COVID. Yeah. Until COVID, uh, people were faxing. You had to provide service of documents in person, file documents in court, uh, in paper. All of that has been swept away. And now because of the uh, information technology upgrade, we can file electronically and operationally do things uh, for uh, lower costs and uh, faster. These uh, cost savings are passed along to the clients, and that expands access to justice. Well, that was an unforeseen outcome of COVID as it impacted uh, the immigration bar and the, the, the federal court, as well as uh, immigration authorities. Uh, so uh, <laughs> when, when you're handed lemons, make lemonade. I think that's, that's uh, the lesson here. Yeah. Uh I, I read an article about your, uh, I think it was prominently uh, reported by CBC and other mainstream media and your lectures on the professional circuit about uh, so-called uh, refusals made without a human uh, evaluation. Uh, as as many many people would, would recognize in their own, you know, many applicants would recognize that they parents, grandparents, and other people who were invited on a simple TRV visa, they are routinely handed down a, a reason called that you do not satisfy me that you will return, something like, you know, maybe yeah. you don't have funds or other, other, other things. And you assertively maintain that these refusals are not made by humans. Uh, a majority of them are not made by humans, or if the humans are, are evaluating them, they are not... Uh, uh, they're not assessing the full force of the factors and other things, uh, you know, given to them by the by the legislation. And so these must be challenged. And I was reading a statistics uh, that you mentioned last, uh, I think in 2019, that you took some cases to judicial review. Uh, out of 27, 22 was settled out of court. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, tell me briefly, what kind of cases were the and what made them uh, you know, agree on settlement these courses? Well, it's a great issue. Let's unpack this uh, for a few minutes. So yeah. the genesis, the idea is Canada has to process literally over 1.2 million uh, temporary resident visas every year. Yeah. How do you do that? So over a number of years, artificial intelligence software was developed to help triage the TRV, temporary resident visa inventory. And, and it did a great job. Immigration Canada took its time, baby steps, because you don't want to make uh, a large number of decisions that are bad decisions. So yeah. they, they, they wait until they got things right. Um, when it comes to a refusal, uh, the refusal uh, may often be triggered by uh, a definition in the artificial intelligence system, 
Were you ever refused a visa before? Does another country say you were refused a visa before? Uh, wow. Things like that. And so the case would ordinarily be ch uh, channeled to a human, uh, uh, some uh, human operating within the immigration structure for um, review and wow. then uh, refusal. Uh, when you look at the numbers of uh, refusals <laughs> reviewed by a human, I, I don't know how you can do 50 an hour or th something like that and properly review things. So the bottom line here is that there were a significant number of refusals generated by the new artificial intelligence decision-making system. That's fine. The real acts that fell onto the system happened in December 2019 when the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Vavilov yeah. said, folks, I understand, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, I understand what you used to do. Uh, you used to list a number of factors or a number of documents that you considered. Here's the result. The rule was as long as that result is justifiable, the result stands. But the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, you can't do that anymore. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada said, you can't have a justifiable decision. So list the documents, list the factors, and a decision. You have to justify the decision with analysis that's intelligible, transparent, in other words, you can no longer make a list of factors, say you considered it in a, some kind of blank statement, and hope that the refusal will stand. But practically, in December 2019, the Supreme Court of Canada can come up with the decision, but when does the Immigration Information Technology System upgrade to take that into account? It can't be done overnight. It takes a long time to write the software, test it in an artificial intelligence, train the officers. So that's going to create a one year, as much as two year window where you can go to federal court within 15 days if your decision is inside Canada or within 60 days if your yeah. decision was rendered outside Canada to challenge uh, my colleagues at Department of Justice, as well as uh, the, the senior people at, at the Immigration National Headquarters, understand this is a problem, but who's going to complain? Who knows about it? And so for the very small number of people who say, wait a minute, this isn't good enough, and they uh, attack through federal court the refusal, uh, the legal argument is garden vanilla simple. You go, here's what they did, list the factors, and a conclusion, where's the analysis? And since it is that black and white, uh, it's not worth litigating if you're the respondent. It's not worth litigating if you're a Department of Justice lawyer who has to recommend to their client whether this way of proceeding uh, complied with the new Supreme Court of Canada decision in Vavilov. Obviously, it doesn't. When it doesn't, the recommendation is to settle. And so the timeline, uh, you I've, in, in the cases that I did in uh, for the period uh, you reported earlier, yeah. yeah, it's a very high settlement rate, but the fun part is it's usually done within six, seven weeks of opening the court case. And in some cases, uh, shorter than that. So it's a very practical uh, alternative. It's also recommended because under this new artificial intelligence system, once you get flagged and tagged with a refusal, that's going to follow you uh, forever. It's also going to be shared with uh, other countries. So yeah. if, if, you, if you don't uh, take advantage and attack it as soon as possible, it's problems. And following that, people ask, how much? Uh, fair <laughs> I and what I recommend you do is to uh, identify a cluster of immigration lawyers using Google or other search engine and put to them your fact pattern, request a quote, yeah. and, and, and go with that. 
I know our office seems to have a, almost a cut and paste turnkey for these by now. Uh, and so in Canadian dollars, if it's something like $5,000 all in, including disbursements and taxes and whatever, uh, that's about it. Uh, so uh, it, it's critical to do this uh, because um, the upgrade to information technology, artificial intelligence, decision making and training of the officers is um, on track. And this window will not stay open forever. Uh, so uh, most people truly should consider the federal court recourse. It sounds complicated. In reality, it takes sometimes longer to explain it than to do it. Uh, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out and seek professional counsel. Yeah. It's, it's good. Uh, friends, if there's one takeaway that you will carry from this interview is that if you have a simple, so-called simple refusal of TRV, maybe a visitor visa or work visa, study visa, especially those category of visas have been turned down repeatedly with, with some, something that it doesn't gel, uh, that you will never return or you do not have money. I mean, you know, those things, 2116B, sometimes, you know, in uh, work permit 205 section or 201B, uh, it is worth considering a judicial review, as Richard has mentioned. It is very possible that you know it may be reversed. It may be sent for redetermination, as is always done in JR. And, and who knows? I, I point this out: um, it's not gun for hire. Yeah. Um, uh, folks, folks like myself, we carefully pre-screen. We don't take on a case to federal court just because we're asked. We yeah. have to make sure that it's strong. Uh, otherwise, it's not worth the money. It's not worth the time for the sure. person. Uh, as well, you're, you're going to be able to sniff it out yourself. The refusals that say um, uh, we've balanced uh, the pull of your family in Canada and your family in your home country, and there's no family in Canada. <laughs> I, I read that case. I know. I, I read that case. There's no family and say family factors. Yeah. I and then uh, very often the gender is wrong. So you got to wonder what was being considered as well. Uh, uh, we don't believe uh, your financial uh, capability is good enough, but it's not your financial capability. It's that of your family, your parents. And I've seen files where uh, they, they don't think they have enough for two weeks in Canada. And, and there's evidence of uh, $400,000 Canadian available yeah. for the person. So, and it's not the fault, if you want to use fault, of uh, the Canadian immigration authorities. They have to go with what they have on hand and yeah. they designed a template to make things go faster which is a benefit for hundreds of thousands of people uh to get their decisions quickly against the small number where <laughs> it's wrong uh so uh, if you think there's uh, something amiss try to find counsel that that will not charge you to consult and look to see whether or not you have a reasonable case so yeah. Uh, in, 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 in an office like mine, we, I take a look at uh, what people send me. I ask them to PDF everything that they sent the visa office, everything the visa office sent them. And it takes me all of perhaps five minutes to screen and, and hit back saying, uh, no, this, this is reasonable. I can understand why there's a refusal or patently uh, this uh, is an error and, and should be litigated. Uh, so uh, don't give up. Don't get yeah. frustrated. Just get information and make a decision based on that information. And, and uh, until I think uh, mid to late 2021, uh, this is going to be an ongoing option. Uh, since uh, uh, we uh, looked at uh, the statistics that you had um, provided earlier, uh, that trend is continuing. COVID suspended a lot of these uh, cases, but processing continued. And for people who were able to provide uh, myself with um, all of their material, I was able to provide it to my colleagues at Department of Justice so that they can uh, reduce their internal inventory building because of COVID by settling out cases. Uh, yeah, uh, let, let, me, let me segue uh, to a, a related topic, uh, uh, judicial review for applications which were charged under Section 40 for misrepresentation. Oh, yeah. 
many, many, a, many a times uh, because I do manage uh, related applications frequently, spouse visa, especially uh, the, there's a ton of students in Canada whose spouses are overseas and they are trying to bring their spouse here on LMIE exempt uh, work permit, which is uh, LMIE exempt uh, code is C42. It is under the immigration mobility uh, policy. Uh, many a times uh, these people, their spouses will be interviewed by the visa officers in, in those countries like India and China, other countries. And they have used a test for regulation four, which is the definition of a spouse as a bona fide who has uh, intent of just marrying and not because of just coming to Canada. If they fail the R4 definition of spouse, uh, they have been handed down uh, misrep uh, PFL to say, look, sorry, you, you were saying that you are spouse. We think you are not a spouse because it's not bona fide and we are going to charge you for misrep. Have you seen some cases uh, similar to these or have you heard about these cases? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, the misrepresentation cases uh, are uh, many. Uh, and uh, why? Uh, it seems that uh, some offices uh, favor handing out misrepresentation determinations like candy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's, what's required is compelling evidence of misrepresentation due to the serious consequence of a five-year ban from applying for any immigration service. Uh, and so for these cases, uh, step one is to determine has there been misrepresentation? And, and um, if there has, you walk away. If, if on the other hand, what's going on is uh, there's just a refusal, uh, why add misrep? If the determination is, um, I, I just don't believe you're, you're in a, a, a marriage uh, that's not for immigration purposes, refuse the case. Uh, that gives the opportunity for uh, federal court, even uh, an appeal to the Immigration Refugee Board if necessary. But misrepresentation is a harsh addition. And uh, some, some officers will uh, hand out uh, the misrepresentation as a penalty uh, for odd reasons. Uh, in, in those cases, what I do is I, I tell the court, look, uh, the officer has discretion to refuse. And I would not be litigating if this was just a refusal because the person is entitled to apply again. Uh, but person can't apply again when there's misrepresentation for uh, five years. And so I'm fighting the misrepresentation. And, and that's when you drill down and engage battle. Uh, very often, uh, the misrepresentation uh, will fail uh, the same test from the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in that it fails to provide uh, adequate analysis. They list the factors. They make a decision. Uh, I, I refuse because uh, I don't think you're really married or you're married for the purpose of uh, obtaining a benefit under the immigration program. And therefore, it's misrepresentation. No, no. You have to engage a separate process to determine whether or not there's misrepresentation. Uh, and so those cases, too, get settled. Uh, the, the case you've described where... Uh, one spouse is in Canada with temporary status. The other spouse is seeking to join uh, the spouse in Canada. How can that be misrepresentation? Uh, if if uh, the visa officer says, I don't believe you're married or I don't believe uh, the, uh, you're in a conjugal relationship or common law or, or that you really intend to live with your spouse in Canada, okay, explain it, provide the evidence, give the analysis. But just to refuse an open work permit, spousal open work permit, and say misrepresentation because uh, uh, you only married after uh, the, the, your spouse got a work permit in Canada, okay, uh, there may be something there. But if the marriage occurred prior to the spouse obtaining that work permit to come to Canada, uh, it just doesn't pass the sniff test. Yeah, there, there are various factors uh, uh, they, they use to sniff out what is a bona fide and what is not. Uh, my, my, 
my pet peeve is not on what factors they use, but what I what I what I'm little angry about is that it's like this. If if I if I'm the visa officer, if I think that you are not a spouse according to my own set parameters, if you are not a spouse, then that means you are trying to bluff me in 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 getting the visa out of me. And now I am going to tell you you are not a spouse. That is why. I am going to charge you for misrepresentation because had I given you the visa, that would have caused uh, material changes in the in your eligibility, and that's why this this is handed down. And yeah. there that, have been number number of cases. I mean, some cases come to me after three months and six months when it is there's no time for JR. Some some come to me uh, before even sixty days, but they don't have the money to go to the JR and they are stuck. I, I cannot even start mentioning that I can I can if I look at my list of you know people who have contact I must have at least 50 plus people who are struggling with this kind of refusal based on a stereotype that the visa officer has sorry you are not a spouse because you did not convince me uh, based on your knowledge about the spouse where did she live in Vancouver what did she eat how many classes she's attending uh, what were you talking you do not have complete information about your spouse that makes me believe that you are not, uh, uh, you know, you're you're not integrated with the with with uh, with, uh, with the conjugal matters of your spouse, something like this, it's, and that's why I'm going to charge you. Well, this is it. I mean, what's required are two separate silos of determination. In silo number one, uh, the, the the officer can look at. Uh, the request for temporary status in Canada, a work permit, a TRV study permit, uh, and conduct an analysis. Let's say uh, relevant to that, material to that, is a marriage. So what's the connection between the marriage and the application for temporary status? If the, if the officer is saying, I don't believe there's a marriage here, fine, make that determination. The determination of misrepresentation goes deeper. Yeah. It's, a, it's a separate, independent, parallel, but related uh, determination. So just because you can't remember uh, a, an address or you make a mistake during the interview or you correct yourself or add new information, that should not be sufficient to trigger misrepresentation. It's got to be material. So if the failure regarding uh, a, a relationship address or a relationship incident uh, 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 that would support uh, the determination the marriage is bona fide, if you make a mistake on that, show me how that's connected to the application for temporary status. You couldn't remember his uncle's first name. Okay, what has that got to do with a work permit? Uh, and, yeah. and they're saying, okay, but this work permit is predicated on being a spouse. So if I don't believe you're a spouse, then I can refuse. Fine, you don't believe I'm a spouse, but how am I, how is that compelling evidence of misrepresentation? And, and that's where uh, the battle of facts uh, occur. Uh, the Vavilov case assists because it's got to be clear and understandable that justification. It's not enough to say you made the following mistake, so I conclude it's misrepresentation. Well, how is it mi misrepresentation? Why is it material? All of this has to be spelled out. Like I said earlier, it's not enough the decision is justifiable yeah. by someone down the road that looks at the file and says, I can see how this result could happen. That's no longer the law in Canada. It has to be clearly spelled out. Here is my thinking. Here is my analysis. And if that's not there, neither should misrepresentation uh, be on the book. Great. Uh, I think, uh, Richard, you will uh, receive a lot of inquiries about, you know, possible cases uh, which well, fall, in, fall into this category. And people will love to... Uh, contact you and and yeah. have them represent the cases for JR. I thank you for that. But the thing I'm also concerned about your point regarding access to justice. Um, if if people most people can't afford a lump sum uh, 
in advance, basically, or at the outset, uh, or, or even 30, 60 days later, uh, to access federal court. So ask your counsel to provide uh, the possibility of a periodic payment schedule. Like, people who want to buy a car aren't expected to pop up 20, 30,000 or more uh, for a car. Yeah. It, it, get those financial options to uh, lock in your judicial recourse. Uh, you shouldn't be deprived of it. Yeah. I'm uh, Guys, I'm showing uh, Richard's uh, information on the website. If you can see his... Uh his website canimmigrate.com and his phone number and and email address is also listed I, can you can you see the screen richard <laughs> just, whatever you do forget the phone you're never going to reach me that oh, way yeah, okay just send send them an email yeah because there's too many people who want to chat and, and there's no voicemail <laughs> don't, no. yes don't, i i, I just, uh before i let you go richard uh, uh i want to um uh get your insight on uh there's, there's trouble going on in Hong Kong. Are you seeing an uh, uptick on immigration inquiries from Hong Kong and China to Vancouver? And how do you see this? Uh, I know it's all connected to the Vancouver real estate. What do you see is happening in the next six months? Well, uh, the, the short version is that um, it's going to be the combination of the new uh, Beijing security law in Hong Kong with, I suspect, over the next 90 days, uh, the installation of additional surveillance capacity in the streets of Hong Kong. Cameras were, there were no cameras before. Other uh, systems to surveil the domestic population. Uh, that's going to contribute to people wanting to leave. Don't forget that new Beijing security law uh, will allow for the seizure of property assets. Very serious. As well, it, it's possible to be summoned uh, yeah. in mainland China. And so that has created, in the short term, a desire to leave uh, Hong Kong to protect people and property. Um, uh, just uh, beware of the unscrupulous. Uh, to come to Canada until the government of Canada announces special measures for the Hong Kong population to facilitate migration to Canada, uh, be careful and, and go long. The best way into Canada uh, for the people born after 1997, uh, because pre-1997, the, the, the United Kingdom is opening its doors, is to uh, uh, obtain temporary status, a study permit, work permit, uh, and then take the normal express entry path uh, as, a, as a road to permanent residence. Uh, there may be, if things get worse in Hong Kong, a benefit. Uh, I remember back in 1989, after Tiananmen, uh, Canada engaged special measures for People's Republic of China students who were already in Canada. Mm. Uh, they were allowed to access permanent residence uh, as a matter of choice. So if you're from Hong Kong and you can get temporary status in Canada and things go very bad in Hong Kong after you're in Canada, there may be special measures to accommodate a multi-year extension of status or facilitated immigration status. So that's the short end. You, you got to watch this as it develops and uh, react when all the rules are known at the time. Yeah. Uh, hey, thank you, Richard, for your uh, perspective and the time that you gave me. And I do follow your uh, your work and your lecture very closely, even though you may not be uh, aware of no. my following. following you. But what is, what is the latest? Uh, before I let you go, just one last. What is the latest of uh, access to information that you're following nowadays? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, uh, as a matter of course, um, uh, I have hundreds of Access to Information Act requests um, um, around uh, immigration and immigration enforcement. And uh, every day uh, there's new material that comes in. Um, the <laughs> so that's, there's enough on topic to fill another hour or two, uh, but the, it boils down to what um, uh, President Reagan uh, said to Mr. Gorbachev: "Trust, but verify." Yeah, verify. I know. I know. I see. It. So you you have you have a you have a good staff that does this a tip on a on a regular daily basis, and then you put them into your into your uh, uh, newsletter. Is that what you do? Well, uh, the the Lex space comes out uh, 11 times a year, monthly, July, August combined for 
last 30 years and it and it goes uh, not just the private sector but the cbsa visa offices um, and um, government stakeholders globally yeah. Uh, so uh, the yes, immigration law and policy uh, is in there. Uh, the staff, what staff? Uh, people can't do this. Uh, I know. I, know. I think I'm the only one who can manage it. Uh, I, I really enjoy um, um, training uh, someone uh, if they have a few years available. Um, but um, it's worthwhile. I've had um, senior uh, officials within the government of Canada saying that, but for um, LexBase, but for the stuff out there, they wouldn't know what their own department is doing and planning. That that uh, is incredible. Something's happening in the same department. Their own statistics, you know, what percentage is approving, disapproving, yeah. they would not know until it comes from a LexBase from the from Richard himself. Yeah, and that's I, pretty uh, yeah. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for your time. I'll really let you okay. go this time, and maybe I'll uh, see you sometime in Vancouver. If you're in Edmonton, then give me a call. I'd definitely like to see you. Pleasure. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.